Welcome to um, another one of innovation conversation series that UNDP is holding. Our intention with these um, discussions is really, it's, it's, it's a foresight mechanism, if you want, of the organization, where when we meet really interesting people who do um, disruptive work, uh, we like to uh, bug them, talk to them and see what we can borrow, steal and cheat about their work and bring it into, uh, into, the, into the organization. Today, we have a special treat to have um, edge riders here, Alberto Cotica, who, as he will tell you, started as an economist, uh, continued on as a, a, a rock mus musician, and then moved on as a network scientist. But really, the story here is that Alberto leads a social enterprise called Edge Riders that is very much premised on this uh, 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 concept that future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. So what that means for us in development is instead of or in addition to organizing ourselves to think about how we might come up with solutions to some of the sticky problems that we're working on ourselves, um, what if we were to complement that with this <laughs> assumption that there are people um, outside UNDP who might have already solved that problem, people who are dealing uh, with, uh, with extreme pain and cost of inadequate policies, of, of exposure to, uh, to to various disaster risks, and because of their their ability to feel that pain, necessity of feeling that pain, but also a specific network that they're a part of, they were able to turn those coping uh, uh, strategies into into solutions. Um, we work with Lego um, uh, around something similar with our Accelerator Lab initiative, and Lego has found, for example borrowing this concept that for every designer inside the house, they have 600 designers outside Lego producing uh, products that are three to five years ahead of the market. Um, we, we have uh, gotten interested in, in Alberto's uh, work uh, and work of edge riders because they have really helped uh, reduce the number of hops that we need to make from more traditional usual suspects that we work with in development, the strong links that we have uh, to those partners who don't quite uh, uh, um, uh, look or, or feel like uh, sort of typical traditional partners, but those who uh, really have very niche uh, skills and expertise and insights around around development. Um, Alberto is with us here today uh, to uh, all day to uh, uh, talk about how networks learn, um, how do we accelerate generating new knowledge uh, about the type of uh, issues that we're dealing with today for which we don't have a template from before that can help us uh, work through them. And he has kindly agreed to spend his lunch <laughs> talking about his work, uh, not just to people in the room, but to a number of colleagues around the world who have tuned in from uh, various uh, UNDP country offices and, and regional hubs. Um, so with this in mind, Alberto, thank you so much. Uh, and over, uh, over to you. Okay, so thanks for having me. Uh, good to kind of meet you, everyone at home or in the office or wherever you are. Uh, let's uh, move to the presentation, please. Oops. Right. Uh, so it starts, uh, I guess, with uh, introducing myself. Uh, uh, so Mili already said it. I am the research director of, of Edge Riders. I used to be an economist. I got very disillusioned by the way economics fails to understand some of the fundamental mechanisms that he's supposed to, to explain. And so I retrained myself uh, as a network scientist. My main contribution to the Edge Riders Collective is in the field of research, and I do it with this uh, interest for human dynamics, called human collective dynamics that I take from economics, but also an attention to relationships as opposed to entities, that is what characterizes the network scientist. In my spare time, I'm an open data and open knowledge activist. And as, as Mili said, I used to be a kind of punk folk musician. And that is kind of relevant because again, music, just like what you guys do, just like development is really about a kind of co-evolving dance of information and knowledge and inspiration and innovation that gets moved across and regenerated constantly across a, a, a vast uh, number of actors, most of which you don't even know. So this is, a, a, is, is an important starting point for, for, for your work. We, we are trying to accomplish something in a world whose exact contours can, we must forever be unknown to us. Nevertheless, these systems do work. And so I, I would like to spend this talk exploring the way, the way this happens. And I'm going to start here. 
So this is uh, the school of Athens, of course, this is Raphael, 500 years ago at the peak of the Renaissance, uh, uh, dedicates a tribute to human learning and to the, the, the courage and, and the accomplishments of, of humans that learn from each other and, and move forward. The Renaissance, I remind you, was a very optimistic period where it looked like you know, we're getting somewhere here. And uh, so what he does is he depicts his best, uh, you know, his top 40 of Greek philosophers, in some cases borrowing the, 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 the faces of his contemporaries. For example, in, in the center of the fresco, you can see that Plato has the features of Leonardo da Vinci. And so he depicts this kind of representation of, of human learning. And as you can see, he depicts it as like a large conversation. Discourse, dialogue is everywhere. Dialogue is a word Plato used to use. And the two uh, top philosophers of so Plato himself and Aristotle are in the center and they are deep in discussion as they, as they come towards us. So uh, Raphael thought that, and Plato thought that dialogue is how we make progress. And they, had, they were onto something because 500 years after Raphael, 2000, 500 years after Plato, this is still how science works. And dialogue is not just a way that you trans transmit knowledge. It's a way that you recombine knowledge and contextualize it. And in doing so, you beget something new. You beget more and more complex uh, new information and knowledge, like a living thing. And in fact, this is also how uh, whoop, life itself works. Life, uh, you can think of, of evolution as a process whereby genetic information is exchanged. But what results is not a, a, a sort of evening out of features, what results is more complexity, higher order mechanism, from unicellular to multicellular, from multicellular to ecologies, from simple ecologies to complex ecology. There, there never seems to be an end to that. So now the problem with all that is that uh, even though conversations are a fantastic system to validate and produce new knowledge, they are very bad at scaling. So if you take a lot of people and make them discuss, what you see is something like this. People will splinter in small groups, conversations do not scale. So in, in a picture like this, you, pro probably a lot of interesting knowledge is being generated, validated, intuitions are being thrown left, right, and center, but we don't know where they are. We cannot access them, and we cannot validate them. So what to do? OK. For now, we have outlined the model, let me recap, that says more or less what follows. First of all, new knowledge is generated by recombining elements of existing knowledge. Second, we have said that knowledge is dispersed and it is encoded into human beings. So it's the people participating in the conversation that are functioning as the gateways for that knowledge. It's not the artifacts, not the books, not the libraries, the people. Hmm? And finally, and this is critical, human beings are connected by networks of social relationships. The network is the highway through which knowledge travels to generate new knowledge and ultimately what we call innovation. So at Agile, if we do this in three moves, the first move is online ethnography. So it starts by having people discuss about something that we are interested in we for any value of we it could be UNDP it could be uh, edge riders itself or some of our clients the people we work with and then we have we, we induce a conversation which happens mostly in writing and on an online platform why this well because by making it uh, in writing it becomes findable, searchable, more or less permanent. So people can do not need to be present in the same time and at the same place to, to, to access it. And online, because that means you can have long hops between local <clears throat> clusters of conversations and other local clusters of conversation. So the, the, the writing asynchronous and online makes it so that over time people find each other. People can gravitate towards the topics that they care about 
and that they're knowledgeable about. And so you get emergent clusters of experts without anybody in the system needing to keep track of who knows what and who is passionate about what, because anyway, you, you cannot have this information for very large groups. But furthermore, some of the people will be multi-specialists. We care about several subsets of our main problem. And those people will lack bridges. We will, they will help connect what is going on here. They will find it relevant for what is going over there. And by they will make the link. We say, hey, you guys are saying kind of the same things, or you guys don't seem to agree on this point. Can you please hash it out between yourselves? And this is how you, A, find knowledge and experiences that you're not aware of, and B, cross-validate it. So this is the principle, more or less. But on, where online ethnography comes in is that we are starting to put this intuition into a rigorous data model that we can process at a sort of scale. <coughs> Right? So ethnography, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, is a qualitative research technique that aims to reconstruct what a group is doing from the point of view of the group itself. So it assumes that the people in the exercise, in the conversation in our case, they know about their world. They know, they know something important about their world. They don't discard their point of view. In the sense, it's, it's a very democratic approach to research, ethnography. And when you do it, you, in practice, you will work with text. Uh, traditional ethnographers do it with uh, uh, transcriptions of uh, um, interviews, but we do it with online posts. They will highlight a snippet of text, and they will associate to that snippet of text a keyword known in ethnographic parlance as a code. So now what we know is that this post talks about something. And the second uh, move that we do, of course, is social network analysis. Because if you've got an online conversation, this is also possible with offline conversations, by the way. But in online conversation, it's even easier to see who is talking to who. This remains encoded in the database of the online platform that you're using for it. So you can fairly easily induce a graph where the, like this one that you are seeing here, where the nodes are people, represent people, and the edges represent the interactions, direct interactions between people. In, in this case, two nodes are connected if person A has commented some content of person B. That will create a connection between them. It means we are talking. Now, the final move is to bring the two things together and replace the ethnographic code of the post in lieu of the free text of the post itself. So when you do that, you find yourself with a kind of a network, like a social network. Again, you have two people talking to each other, but now you have also semantics. You have meaning. They are talking to something, to, to each other, about something specific. And, and when you have this, well, then you could uh, uh, do several things with, 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 this, with this idea. Uh, you could, for example, generalize it. So what I showed you before was an atom of a semantic social network. This is what we call this particular type of network. It's semantic social network because it's a social network that encodes semantic. Here's, I made, a, I made a toy network uh, uh, about care. And then uh, you know, it's not very really telling us very much uh, to a first approximation, but then we can manipulate it because now it's a graph. And the graph is a well understood mathematical object. So one thing we can do is, for example, we can filter it. And here I uh, filter it for design. Uh, I, I only want to see the part of this conversation which is about design. And then once I filtered it, I can talk about and think about what I see. In this particular case, I'm seeing a disconnect. Even though everybody is connected to everybody else in the whole conversation, this is not true for the subset of the conversation, which is about design, where you can see that there are three people on the left that are not really connected by conversations about design to the two people on the right. So you have a potential for balkanization or for imperfect validation. They could be talking about completely different things and not even know. If this exercise is still going, 
we, you can ask people to talk to each other and kind of merge the two subgraphs. If not, uh, you, you just know how to interpret your, your results. But I can also uh, sweep, switch this idea around and, and create from the same data a network of codes that are connected by people. Now, you can think of this as a kind of association patterns for groups. So uh, two uh, concepts are connected when they are mentioned by the same person together. Okay, so that person acts as a kind of bridge between the two concepts. And, and once again, when I do that, I can, I can see in this case that the, the graph is not co fully connected. There are two subcomponents. Maybe the, the, these people are talking about two different things. They, 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 they don't really resolve into one uh, close uh, corpus of uh, concepts. So this is the main idea. And I want to give you an example with real data. It's a project called Open Care. The project Open Care was about starting with a very loose question, uh, uh, as all these projects do. The loose question was, so what happens when communities have to provide their own social and health care, when the state is not coming, when the private sector is not interested, when we are too poor, we have no money, nobody wants to serve us, so we have to make our own. What will we do? We will do this more or less the same kind of a basic version of what you see in a, in a, in a social, in a, in a national health care system. We will see something different. So this is what, where we started. And, and we ran this exercise for about a year and a half. And by the end, we had 338 participants called key informants by ethnographers with about 4,000 posts, about 800,000 words. To give you an idea, this is like if you, if you had like the Lord of the Rings plus the Hobbit. So like quite a substantial corpus of, 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 of words. And 338 participants, these were new people into the network who got drawn in by a conversation or a mix of existing network members and new that converge over a topic? It was a mix, uh, but with the prevalence of new people. What, what we have found is that when, when you launch a new topic, you attract quite a lot of specialists that only care about that and they were not particularly interested in engaging with you before also we look in the in the right places yeah. for example uh, in, uh, in in the case of community health and social care we started by e experiences that we knew because they happened in our in our space mm -hmm. and then we asked everybody who else do you know that is doing this and then you hop through the social graph and their social graphs will be more connected than mine in the field of social and healthcare yeah. because that's what they care about. Yeah. And given the small world results uh, yeah. that, you know, that since the, yeah. the famous six degrees of separation experiments, mm -hmm. it doesn't take a large number of hops before you've basically covered the whole planet. And this is how you can, you can fish quite a lot of interesting experiences in a relatively simple way. Yeah. And then we had an ethnographer read all the stuff and code it. And then we, in, we ended up with uh, about 1,200 codes, like uh, 1,200 concepts or experiences or things that were noted to be important. And the result in the end was, was this. So this is a map of the semantic side of the semantic social network, how, how codes connect. There are many more. I told you there are 1,200. So it, uh, it, it was a completely unreadable very large graph with about 20,000 connections. But what we could do is we could filter by the strongest connections. Because some of these connections have only been made once, but some of them have been made many times. So the community as a whole was validating the stronger connection and leaving the weaker connection, even though nobody in the community, no individual was aware of this, because you just connect what you connect, this is just what you think. You, you have no idea what other people are doing around you. So this result is really quite unbiased and uh, a really collective intelligence in the sense that it emerges from all of these 4,000 posts that had been ha happening in a conversational environment. And if you have a patience to look at this graph, you can see that it organizes quite nicely around clusters that are more connected within the cluster than across the cluster, but they're still connected somehow across the cluster. Uh, the, the, the color coding, by the way, is algorithmic. This is a, a community detection algorithm that we run on the graph. And if you go and look at what the nodes of the same color are, you'll find a, co a human will find a coherence that is actually detectable by algorithms. 
So I don't want to go into what that means, but you can see clusters. So there is a mental health clusters on, on the left. Uh, there's a, a more design oriented uh, cluster on the, on the right uh, around the design intervention uh, code. Some of the stuff is fairly obvious. So mental health, of course, is connected to trauma and to group therapy. What else would it be connected to? But you can also see that it's connected to less uh, obvious stuff. For example, creativity or art. And that turns out to be that uh, uh, around some, some experiences that have been, uh, been happening on the ground of connecting. Uh, this was mostly about new migrants and refugees that were having a lot of mental health problems with very little um, possibility to access traditional services, also because of language barriers. And so practice of art turned out to be helpful in, in, for them. And then it might help other people. Suppose you are a, a, like responsible for mental health and well-being in your city, and you see that people do not access your services. Then maybe you want to talk to the artists. Maybe this is an intuition that might also work for you. So in other words, all of these are discussions around cases where alternative ways of open care are being done <laughs> that are for all intents and purposes under the radar. Correct. Uh, the, the whole, every one of these 4,000 posts, we try to make it about something like this. Edge Riders really encourages experiential data. Don't tell us what you think. Tell us what you do. And in, in, in this way, the, the people who get uh, premiered and like uh, uh, rewarded and, and uh, admired by, by, the, by the community, the emerging community, the conversations are the doers. This uh, cuts the rents, makes the conversation much more fact oriented because it's really not about what I think or what you think, it's what about what happened on the ground. And I was there, right? So there's really not a lot of discussion to be had around, around some stuff like that. And we can focus on interpretation. So, yes. And we uh, encouraged everybody to look for similarities and differences and find other examples in their communities that would do mm -hmm. something similar. And in the end, we, we are left with a couple of hundreds of, of, of experiences. OK, so behind this uh, semantic network, there's a community of people which means, by extension, that each person has their own semantic network, which is the network of the graph, of the, of the codes, of the concepts that that person turns out to be interested in at the end of the exercise. So we see here two people. The one on the left is more of a, uh, of a generalist, because he, he seems to be more interested in more things. He is talking about many things, even though if you, if, you, if you zoom in, you'll find there's a lot of stuff about design. This is a biohacker, somebody that comes from the Belgian biohacking community. The person on the right is more of a specialist, fewer concepts, and they are all closely related to urban planning, urban development, neighborhood design, participatory practices in that context, etc. Uh, however, you, you can also look at what any two or, in fact, any N people in the community have in common. And these two people, just to give you an example, they turn to have in common design as a methodology. So what you see on the left is the semantic network of the codes that they both have mentioned in their contributions. So biohacker and urban planner. Yes. Having... In design common. in common yeah. and there may be some potential here for you know cross reading yes. or whatever which however in this case is not really exploited because you can see on the left the social network of these two is disconnected they are never interacted in the conversation and so again you might want to encourage them to do so and maybe something new will, will come out of it and i can also flip this idea around and look at the social networks behind any concept so you can see here that uh, on the left, biohacking has a social network which is not very large, whereas migration has a much larger and, and even more dense uh, social network, which means that this, okay, trivially, this community, more people were interested in migration and in biohacking. But more operationally, if you want to know something more about biohacking, you no longer need to target 330 people because you know who 
your emergent cluster of experts of biohacking are. And you can be much more economical targeting just the biohackers. And this is, turns out to be a good move because bio, the people interested in biohacking are all connected. They are not, they don't, there's no, no potential for balkanization here. They are within line of sight of, of each other, right? Uh, and the final thing that I want to show you is that you can select any connection between two concepts or ethnographic codes and then see what the social network of that connection is. So not no longer the social network of a single code, but of a connection between codes. And the one up on the, on the top of, the, of this uh, visualization, you see uh, it, it consists of only four people, none of which ever talk to any of the others. So that seems like a fairly weak connection, not in the, in the, in the sense that it was made few times. This is already a strong connection. It's weak in the sense that there's not much validation going on. It's just some people that care passionately about it and keep banging that particular drum, but there is no collective intelligence at work. Whereas the connection below has a fully connected and quite dense social network. So that is not only a strong connection that was made several times in several posts across the conversation, but also was made by people that were talking to each other. So in the sense is much more strongly validated. So, to summarize, we've been looking at uh, semantic social networks, which is a representation of data that I would like to propose you is good at doing what you guys need to do. That is, you need to find and validate very many experiences that are happening on the ground that are not necessarily on your radar. And even when you find them, you might not be able to interpret them straight as they come. Mm. So the stress of representation of data is good because once you find, find a lot of, this, of that stuff, then you can, you can see, you, you can get a big picture view of a problem at hand, which was a colorful graph that I showed you a few slides back. And you can zoom in to an actionable subset. For example, uh, I, I gave you this, this idea of the uh, mental health and, and art and creativity, mm -hmm. and how you, can, you could translate that intuition into, a, into an action, something to try and do. And it can allow direct interaction with the people who have provided the actionable information. So this is not dead knowledge stored in reports. This is living knowledge stored in people, and you know who people are, and they are in that conversation already. So you can go back to them and ask them more questions, and you know, interview them, hire them, become friends with them, whatever. They're, they're, they're really there. And they are your domain experts, your community domain experts. And finally, there is no need to know what you're looking for when you start looking. This is... Uh, uh, a profound intuition by Eric von Hippel in 2017, who claimed that you can solve the problem without having to define it first. And the way you would do it is you would have a loose definition of the problem or the direction in which you're looking. And then you will just look for what people are already doing in that particular area. And what you will find is that people will crawl the solution space, is, is, the, is the term that von Hippel uses. They will try very many different things. Most of them will die off. Some of them will be successful if you pick them up. This is a very efficient method because you don't have to carry the cost of all those failures. And you, you're just kind of already starting from the mid-level mm -hmm. success. OK, I think I want to stop uh, here. Uh, one word about applications. Well, okay, qualitative research at scale. We use this for that. Participatory design. You can start with a, with a community of people and, and try to find out what they know, what they are trying to do, and and then only later what help they need as a consequence of that. Uh, you can use it for stakeholder dialogue and try to map what different people think, what they see when they look at the issue you're trying to change. You can try to do horizon scanning and foresight. This was actually the first application that we did actually with the UNDP, our very first Edge Riders project in 2014, I believe. 14, yeah. uh, you can use it for risk assessment. This is a favorite of mine mm -hmm. because contextual information means that you can interpret mm -hmm. uh, data points mm -hmm. rather than just have them. So if a 
some materials were missing for your construction site, that might mean that some local kid in the village got drunk and then they broke in and they stole some stuff, no big deal. It can also mean that the rule of law is breaking down in the area. And you will not know unless you're a local or you know the context well. So the, 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 the data point in itself is not very informative. What's informative is the data point plus the community that can interpret it. Um, Okay, this is not sentiment analysis, by the way, in case I, I always get this question. We don't do that. We model humans as uh, intelligent, full citizens, adults, whereas sentiment analysis comes from marketing and tends to model humans as desire machines. And the, the problem is just to find and press the right emotional buttons. And uh, my final thing is that you've seen a lot of data and graphs and some mathematics behind it, but uh, borrowing a, 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 a quote from the late Hans Rosling, I would like to say that, you know, I'm a data guy, I like data, but it's never about the data. It's always to look at data through them to get to the people behind the data. So this is what we think social semantic network analysis is good for. And right, so there's a link to a paper if you more academic style if you want to read. And I'll be sure to share this slide deck for anybody who's yes. interested. Yes. Thank you, Alberto, so much. Um, we have since had quite a few people also join, which, which is fantastic. Um, again, one of, the, one of the big insights that we've picked up in working with, uh, with, with Alberto and, and the team at EdWriters is uh, this, this concept. And it's funny, there's a question from Turkey that goes along these lines. Uh, we have been so premised in terms of looking at the future by really looking, you know, what are the things coming uh, beyond the bend, the minority report kind of things. Whereas in what we really learn is you can study the future by carefully observing what is happening today. Um, and that has that has not been necessarily the most intuitive uh, insight for the organization, and it required a bit of a mind bend to understand how do we organize ourselves to be better at doing that. You you know the one of the discoveries for me was that expert knowledge and on the ground knowledge turned out to be sometimes quite different. So for example, okay, let's go back to the health and social care example. There's if you if you venture into this field, you will hear a lot about e-health and your know, technologies that will change this, this field. And so you would expect that when communities have to provide for themselves, they will turn to some kind of technology, but they don't, never. One exception, they turn to the technologies that help them connect to each other. So communities faced with that kind of thing they, they have a kind of different, uh, a different outlook, which uh, is hard for me not to see as less biased. Mm -hmm. no? uh, so a, a, another example that is even more striking maybe from the healthcare world, 90% of what we found that was happening was prevention. Yeah. Yoga, running, uh, mental well-being, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, peer-to-peer -peer combating, this kind of stuff. And it makes complete sense that if these are very high return investments on, on health, right? It's a really great investment if you put most of your money on prevention. But this is not what we do. Public healthcare system do the opposite. Mm. They put 90% on, 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 on treatment and 10% on prevention. Right. So maybe there's something to learn here. Certainly there is a, a nice feeling of perspective. No? Mm. And uh, well, this particular finding has, a, has another small data point. The Hamish do the same as the communities. So they don't believe in insurance mm. because they think that insurance will de-responsabilize you. So uh, Hamish healthcare works that people, uh, when you feel, you feel, you feel fall ill, you will go to the church or your relative will go to the church and say, hey, Alberto has, uh, is sick and we need to kind of help him. And people will chip in and will, will figure out a way, maybe pay for some treatment or whatever. But now what happens is that they are very aware that my need to become healthy again contrasts with your need of getting married and your need to uh, build a new bar. The community has only limited resources. So as a result, I will be very careful not to smoke, 
you know, to be very careful with uh, with my uh, food uh, habits, so that I don't put an unnecessary burden on my community. And just taking that example of health one step further, when this was a couple of years ago, um, you know, when you think about future of health, you would probably think about Israel and you would probably think of South Korea. Whereas in what you guys have found is Greece after the financial crash. One of the things that happened was as many people lost their jobs, they got disconnected from the healthcare system. And then the health community, the doctors and the nurses organized themselves and established hundreds of pop-up clinics around the country to provide healthcare services to those who were left without the healthcare uh, insurance. They didn't accept any donations or funding. You could, you could help by donating equipment. So is that a weak signal, and time, is that a weak signal of a different way of organizing the health um, healthcare systems uh, in the conditions of extreme, uh, of extreme stress? So um, I have a couple of questions coming in from colleagues online that I would like to pose. So Turkey is saying, um, this is looking at the future by observing carefully what's happening today. What types of skills and processes do we need to have as a large bureaucracy to do this better? Do you want me to read? I have three. Do you want me to read through them, or do you want to take them one at a time? I don't. I don't really understand this one. Uh, so this is looking at the future by observe. So this presuming the what, the, what the method of what you guys do, looking at the future by observing carefully what is happening today. What types of skills and processes do we need to have as a large bureaucracy uh -huh. to do this better? Well, uh, I don't know about large bureaucracy. Uh, um, this is, it's a human thing of just getting in and, uh, and doing uh, this kind of listening exercise uh, at, at the most basic <laughs> level, which is something that UNDP already does. Uh, then there are some, uh, some uh, more specific skills that have to do with, uh, for example, making an online conversation rewarding enough so that uh, people will keep coming and they will mm. keep uh, validating and uh, answer the questions that mm. other people ask them, uh, etc. And there will be also this, uh, this uh, willingness to uh, let content come somehow, mm -hmm. and uh, in some cases also to not to be, to be afraid. In my experience, this was never a problem with the NDP, but before being a company, as riders was a project at the Council of Europe, and there we did have some political problems, because the, the our ally and funder of the whole of the whole project at the time was the DG employment at the European Commission, and 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 they were asking the question, what can we do to fight youth unemployment? And when the the conversation came back and said, you cannot do you cannot solve youth unemployment. If you could do it, you would have done or you would have done it already because the motivation are there. The real question that we are asking ourselves and you should be asking is, how do we thrive in a post job economy? Mm -hmm. And that the employment didn't like a bit because it basically broke down the whole world of you know, stakeholder dialogue and let's talk to the trade unions here and let's talk to the to the employers there and and uh, they, they had their own kind of system and none of this was relevant it was completely yeah. orthogonal so be careful what do you look for um yeah. the question from somalia is how do you reconcile offline and online communities to ensure inclusion we have never really cracked this completely because this is always a, a difficult balance. So the, the typical thing is the tele, what we call a telegraph yeah. model. Telegraph model works like the telegraph back in the 19th century where communication happened with telegraph, but not everybody had a telegraph. So the last mile between the post office with neither the telegraph and your house would be some, some guy on a horse or, or, or on a bicycle. And that's how mm. practically almost everybody was reached by the telegraph model, not by telegraph, but by horse. So in, in this case, the telegraph is the online platform that we, can be global and the, and the horse can be like an offline community meeting right there in your community. The problem with that is you, you tend to lose the immediacy and the spontaneity of the single voices. It's a different thing if I speak my mind and if I somebody else interprets my words it's also a bit disempowering so we try not to do it but uh, it's uh, honestly it's, it's kind of difficult so now we, 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 we are doing things like okay let's have a really nice local community event really nice you know we're going to make it super nice for you we're going to go out of our way to have like good food and whatever and it's free 
but you have to pay by writing. And then you get a story. Or another possibility is you 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 go to in-depth in interviews and then mm. you put those. Right. As, uh, so the, the, we are managing this uh, problem, but we, we haven't solved it. I don't think we can solve mm. it. Um, two questions from Colombia. I think one you answered with the open care, but I'll pose both of you, both of them to you. Could you give us an example of a network analysis flagging an emerging trend by looking at who is talking to whom about something new? Question one. And question two. Why do people come to play with edge riders and not with us, UNDP? Oh. <laughs> it's a pretty good question. Uh, okay, so uh, for the first question, I'm, I'm trying to find of a particularly nice example. Okay, no, but but this uh, um, ah sharing stories. This is a good one. So th th there is a, a cluster of uh, um, heavily connected nodes uh, around migration, and again, some you can imagine prob lists of issues that that uh, migrants, refugees. Lo lots of these stories were about actually refugees, not just migrants. There are many stories from Greece. Turns out, an anarchists are running 400 unofficial uh, safe houses for, for, uh, for refugees in Greece, or were at that time. Some of them very small, maybe three, yeah. five people that were being hosted. Okay, so you see something that, like uh, language or mm. stuff that you, you, you could expect. And then one was sharing stories, right? mm. sharing stories. And then it turned out that some people trying struggling with uh, the integration or whatever it was some kind of integration of a lot of people with almost no resources in a short time they found out that exchanging life narratives would smoothen things up a lot between people, host communities yes and coming yes and and uh, suddenly a lot of problems will become much more manageable. And this was a very strong connection. We're like, wait, what? What do you mean by story sharing? And then we we went down and read the post, and, and we found out that that was a quite a um, quite a stable finding that had been picked up by by several people that had a, that kind of experience. Okay. And uh, the second question was, why do people play with us? The answer is they don't really. I mean, also there is no. There is no edge riders. We we really tend to uh, bring people in on the basis that they really care about the specific issue that we are looking at. So I imagine that you are one of those Greek anarchists and, and you're running this this uh, rundown squat in, peri in the periphery of Athens and you've got, uh, whatever, seven people that kind of escaped from one of the refugee camps and, and you are trying to make them okay. <laughs> of course you care about what other people are doing in, in that area. And some of the, the people that, uh, people like you will also care about some other aspect of the same community, social and healthcare thing, because that's how the activist world, look, world looks like. And then that person will connect you to, for example, the, the people in Milano that are uh, trying to get shopkeepers to put in ramps, like removable ramps, for uh, wheelchairs mm. in a medieval city where often you don't have a physical space to create a permanent ramp mm. so the wheelchair can, can go into the shop. And, and all this kind of stuff. Mm. So it's mostly driven by, I don't think there is any, there's any magic in edge riders. Mm. There is the, the lure of the urgent problem that you're already working mm. with and of your peers. Mm. The promise is you'll meet, we are trying to find people like you that you can gang together with uh, and then we try to give them a good experience when they go in to, to, to yeah, reward what they do. And I think this is what puts in focus a, a really stark difference in approaches. In 2014 when we started seeing massive amounts of people coming through Greece, Macedonia and Serbia onwards to Hungary, most of the development work in that region was premised on let's help local governments be able to deal better with this influx of the population. There was one single project that we found where the team said, we're gonna take government's incapability to deal with essentially a black swan event as a given, huh. and we're gonna look at how his community organized itself 
to help the people coming through. And then they found, for example, a WhatsApp group of single mothers in an area in, 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 in Eastern Macedonia who provided, who got together and got blankets, food uh, and transportation for families with kids from one border to another, for example. But I think this is a very, it's, it's a very different approach to looking at where the solutions, uh, solutions sit. Indeed. Um, we have a, another question here uh, from a colleague from India. What changes can we expect in health and education in the next 10 years? Uh, I, I, I honestly have no idea. It's a bit uh, of an unfair question. I have no idea. It's a, it's a very contested uh, field. Mm. What I do know is that, that there is a, an inbuilt tendency towards uh, um, two things we found in open care. One was the DIY. So uh, the, 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 the prevention, so to mm. speak, approach, and, and you can see in in cities in Western Europe. Uh, uh, I don't know America all that well, but I think it's here too. There are now substantial minorities that are really going prevention. Mm. Um, they are really going green. They are really going uh, exercise. They are really going yoga. They are uh, some of these sports are now mass sports. You see, like. 60,000 people at the London Marathon. Mm. That's like a lot of kilometers. And, <laughs> and, and that, when I was young, nobody did that. That, was, that didn't exist. And these are all uh, hard strokes that don't happen. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a measurable impact on healthcare expenditure based on that. And this is definitely happening. Nobody's stopping it. The other thing that's happening, people are trying to stop it. And that is the, 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 with the hacking around drugs, mm, yeah. the open source yeah. drugs. So in America, there is the, the most radical group uh, called the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective. Mm. And these are people that they start from the premises that, okay, they are biotechnologies, which mm. is now nowadays easy to be. There's quite a biohacking community that is just in these years coming together. It's quite easy to get basic equipment, mm. gets donated super fast. We know people in Belgium, no problem. And CRISPR is getting super yeah, cheap. cheap. So it's getting to the point where people have that too. So the four thieves vinegar folks, they say, it's better to break the copyright laws than to let people die. And then they mm. take it from there. But then, so for example, one thing that happened is that they reverse engineered a molecule that prevents HIV uh, transmission. Already they broke whatever patent laws. But then they worked with drug dealers in America to cut heroin with the molecule. With the idea that you would inject your heroin and by doing that you would immunize yourself against the HIV transmission. And now when health authorities see this, they really don't know what to do. <coughs> when big pharma sees this, they do know what to do, which is put those, those guys away and throw away the key. So right now there is this kind of battle. Um, it, it will play out, I predict, in America, where healthcare is very expensive. I know personally this one genius guy called, called Anthony, who is a diabetic. And he is now working on a protocol with other people from Australia and from Belgium. This is like hack, like software development, so they're completely global. They're working on an open source protocol to make human insulin. Insulin per se is not uh, patented because it's uh, biosimilar, so it cannot be patented. But the delivery methods keep being repatented, and by this way, insulin, the price of insulin is kept artificially high. But then he says something more. He says, I want to heal. Nobody, I can't trust academic and business research to heal diabetes because a diabetes patient is much more valuable to that industry than a, than a healthy person. Therefore, he's looking into DIY gene therapy to cure diabetes. And he'll do it. I mean, he'll maybe, he will fail probably, but he will definitely try and do it. He's got the means. And this guy is stashed away in Oakland in a, in a kind of garage. Huh? So this kind of stuff will... I predict will, will happen. Yeah. Very good. Um, I've kind of monopolized questions from, from online because there are several coming in, but 
Any questions from the from the room? I know we've Let's taken. Take what we can from the yeah. colleagues. Okay. Yeah, we have more time with them. Yes, we 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 have an hour. We have to also yeah. go back to the, yes. to the to the reason why we actually brought Alberto here around learning network. But um, thank you. This was this was this was um, very interesting, and we have quite a few people uh, who have tuned in. So um, I expect quite a bit of feedback. Yeah, please pa this. Uh, pass it on, and we'll yes. take it. Uh, we'll take it. Yes. Online. Yes. Fantastic. Promise to answer everybody. Thank everybody. you so much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, uh, loved having a, a big group uh, yesterday with Julio around system thinking, complexity, and development, and today with another Italian. So it's an Italian week, really. With, <laughs> with it's Alberto. always Italian or, week. It's always Italian, Italian week. week. Um, um, we will uh, we will feed back with uh, video recordings of both. Uh, talks and we will share the slides and we look forward to having everybody online uh, next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.